So good morning and welcome to the second lecture of uh, discrete mathematics introductory course. Uh, today we'll introduce the second homework in which it will be a programming assignment. So this will be just an introduction. The details will be published on the course's web page and in Teams, um, I hope, by the end of this week. So the de details, this means deadlines, uh, the way we should submit it, etc. But you can start thinking about it and maybe even programming. This all will be in today's lecture. But we'll start with reminding uh, all of you about the things we are actually doing now. So um, this is about um, resolution method. And uh, there is a second word here, which is uh, called parsing. And we'll discuss it in a minute. So this program assignment will combine. So we continue discussing satisfiability of Boolean formulae. And uh, uh, there is a satisfying assignment. Uh, that means that you assign some zeros and ones to the Boolean values in the Boolean formula, and you should get one uh, using the truth tables. So satisfiability is a model example of a more general thing, which is finding some object with given properties. So this is a model example, but it's really a very generic thing. But more precisely, it's not finding, it's checking for existence. And we'll see that this is an important difference between them, because resolution method, which we exercise now, does not really give us, well, it will give us, but with some addition. But as is, it does not give us the satisfying assignment itself. It just says that the satisfying assignment exists or not. Well, if not, then everything is OK. There is no object with given properties. It's fine, but if it says yes, then we have to do some extra work to really find this assignment. So this is the difference between search and uh, uh, between uh, decision and search problem. OK, so recall that resolution method is a method of uh, determining whether a Boolean formula is satisfiable. The Boolean formula should be given in conjunctive normal form in CNF. So a CNF is a conjunction of clauses. Each clause is a disjunction of literals. So to remember the external connected should be conjunction if you're talking about CNF and it should be disjunction if you're talking about DNF but the internal one inside the clauses is opposite of course so it's a disjunction of literals each literal is either a variable or negation and uh, uh, the CNF is a conjunction of such clauses and we'll write them just as a list so each clause is a constraint on our satisfying assignment the object we're seeking for so we just write them as a list and then we saturate it using the following resolution rule. So if you have one literal P in one clause and it's opposite literal and then negation P in another clause, you can remove them and glue these clauses together, getting a, an extra clause, which is added to our CNF. And saturation means that we perform it, and, well, while it's possible. So in the end, you get all the clauses you could obtain using this rule. So, the clause could be empty. It means an empty disjunction. The empty disjunction is constant false because in a disjunction you add possibilities, but if you have empty disjunction, no way to satisfy it. So if you have, say, to satisfy this disjunction, you can just say x equals zero or y equals one. But to satisfy the empty clause, there's no possibility. So if you get this, then it is not satisfiable. Why? Well, because resolution rule, as stated here, it keeps validity. So if some assignment satisfies both A or P and B or not P, then this assignment should also satisfy A or not B. You can easily prove this just by checking two cases for P. P can be either true or false, and this will give, if it's true, then B should be also true, and if it's false, then A should be true. So if you have a satisfying assignment, then uh, it will be kept by the resolution rule, and if using resolutions, you get empty clause, that means false, which is not satisfiable. And the original CNF is also not satisfiable. But moreover, there is a complete theorem that states that this is a criterion. So if you obtain the empty clause, you are not satisfiable. But if you couldn't obtain it, then you should be satisfiable. Or in contraposition, if you are satisfiable, then you can not obtain the false object. So 
This means that saturation really gives us an algorithm for checking satisfiability, because when you try to saturate, you find out all the clauses which could be obtained by resolution, and if there is no empty clause, then you are satisfied. But however, that does not give us the satisfying assignment itself. So you, if, if you get false, you get not satisfiability, and you get sort of a witness for that, this uh, series of resolutions which led you up to uh, the, the, this non-satisfiability, non the empty clause. But if you didn't get the empty clause, you don't know what is the satisfying assignment. In other words, this method solves a decision problem, but not a search problem. But if you're lucky enough and the CNF has only one satisfying assignment, the following happens. The, after saturation, you will get isolated literals. So you will get a clause which includes, say, just X or just not Y. There is only one way to satisfy such a clause, and they dictate the uh, desired satisfying assignment. But this happens only if you have one or maybe a few satisfying assignments. If there are many of them, this they will not work. You will get some non-trivial clauses, how to satisfy them, and the following consideration can be used. Let's formulate the proposition. It's quite easy. So if you have a CNF which is saturated, we'll call it S, and it does not include, so it is, it is uh, satisfiable, it does not include the empty clause, but also if it does not include not X, then you can freely add X. So you, you see that if the clause does not, uh, so, okay, you had a CNF, you saturated that, Saturating means that all the implicit information which was inside the CNF gets explicit. So if it was uh, contradictory, not satisfiable, then you will get explicit contradiction that the empty clause is false. But, okay, it does not say that X should be false. And this means that X sh may be true. It, it is not uh, obliged to be true, but it may be true. If you don't have not X because all the information in the saturated thing is explicit. And then you can just add it, or vice versa, if you don't have X, you can add negation X. So this, again, the saturated CNF does not force you for X to be true, you can make it false. If you, if you have neither X or not X, your choice can be arbitrary. So after making this arbitrary choice, you should saturate again because sometimes there could be hidden uh, dependencies on them. So this is an example. You have X or not Y and X or Z. And if you, so here you can choose for Y. So there, this is saturated, by the way. There are no resolutions which could be applied here, right? Because there are no two clauses with uh, opposite literals. And for each variable, it does not dictate us the assignment. So you can say, say, Y equals one, Y equals zero, or x equals y, x equals 0, or the same for z. But if you choose x equals 0 and add not x, then immediately new resolutions can be applied, and you get the satisfying assignment. And it's now it's unique. You should put y equals 0 and z equals 1. So because the, the, this is, these are dependencies. So the first one is x or not y. What does it mean? It means that y implies x. So if x is false, then y should also be false. And for Z again, if X is false, Z should be true to save the second, to satisfy this second clause. So let's prove this proposition is quite easy. It's easier than the completeness theorem. By the way, we didn't yet prove it, but if we have time, we'll prove it uh, in the end of this lecture. So uh, new resolutions, which can be applied to satisfy S and X, should involve this new clause X, right? Because S is saturated. You cannot apply any resolution inside X, inside S. You can only apply things which include this new variable X. And uh, therefore, if such a resolution generates false, generates the empty clause, then inside the original S, there should have been not X, which is not the case. This proves the proposition. So here is an example. This is a clause, uh, oh, a CNF, sorry. So what ha what actually happens here? So here it says P implies R or S, R implies Q, and S and P implies Z, Z implies T. I just 
respell this in the terms of implications. It's the same. And you postulate P. So when you postulate P, you should postulate R or S. You should postulate then. And then you have a choice. Either you say that R is true or S is true. So and all these go down, down, down. You can saturate it in the following way. So I'm, you're not supposed to read and thoroughly check everything which happens, but the idea is that you actually use P and then you propagate it downwards. But uh, still there is only one, it's in blue here, I don't know whether you should see it, P is in blue. So it dictates that P should be true. But this is what we knew actually from the original CNF. In any satisfying assignment, this clause should be true, therefore P should be true. But um, the interesting thing here is that uh, now we do not know anything about all other variables, but we are saturated, so we can make an arbitrary choice. For example, I say I want S to be true. If I make S false, then R should be true, right? But if S is true, we don't know nothing about R, but we know Z and T. Why? Because we have these clauses Z implies T and uh, somewhere the S and P implies Z. We know that S is true, we know that P is true, therefore Z should be true. So these are fixed, P is fixed, S is fixed. Also there are some new clauses generated here, but they're actually redundant because we know that uh, Z is true, therefore not P or Z is also true. It's weaker. And then you go further. So now you can make an arbitrary choice. We have still have R and Q, right? If we make a choice for Q, we just make a choice for Q, and R is still arbitrary. But if we make a choice for R, then Q should be true, if we, if we say that it is true, because R implies Q. So gradually, by adding, adding things, we... So uh, now the procedure for searching for uh, and satisfy an assignment, it's actually, say, overlaying steps. So first you saturate, then you find out what uh, isolated literals are there and what variables already receive their value. It's the only satisfying assignment for them. If a variable after saturation didn't receive a value, then you, uh, what, what do you do then? Then you put an arbitrary value for that, make an arbitrary choice. You can always make zero, for example, always make one. Add the corresponding isolated literal to the CNF and perform saturation again and again until you reach the final result. But these new saturations, they will be small because you have to saturate only against this new, uh, uh, new isolated literal. So now about complexity. If the clause includes at least three literals, and you have two such clauses, if you resolve them, you will get four, right? So this is an example. And this can lead to growth, and this makes the situation of saturation potentially exponential. We have an example in the practical class today. It was in our previous uh, sheet of exercises, but by now just uh, uh, this quite easy to believe because possibly you could even generate maybe all the possible clauses or something like that. So you can obtain new and new clauses. If you make four versus four, you will get six. And clauses of arbitrary length could appear in our saturation. And the total number of such clauses is roughly speaking two to the power of n. Not exactly, but uh, something like that. But for two CNF, where each clause includes no more than two literals, the clauses do not grow. So we'll see the usefulness of the two CNF in the graph theory, I think in two weeks. But now we just see it as a good example of a thing which uh, makes things good. Because here we have two and two, we we'll remove one and get two. We could get less because they, they could copy each other or something like that, but it could not grow. And there is a polynomial upper bound which makes the saturation process polynomial. So here is an idea how it can be organized you can take each clause from the list. So you have a list of clauses and you start from the second one, resolve it against the first one, then you take the third one and resolve it against the two previous ones, etc. What happens if you get a new clause? You just append it to the end of the list. So therefore it will be considered in the future and you don't lose anything. The only thing you should check here is that the clause is really new, that you do not add 
clauses which were already on the list. Well, the list gets exhausted, you stop. And this is the saturation. Actually, if you get false, you stop immediately. It's unsatisfiability. Uh, unsatisfiability. But if uh, it doesn't get false, you can, at that, at that point, we can stop and say that the CNF is satisfiable. If you wish to get the satisfying assignment, you mm, proceed, but you proceed uh, by adding an arbitrary value for any variable which is not yet uh, uh, involved in an isolated literal. So this is a process which is polynomial. Well, it could be cubic if you are not that accurate in uh, all these processes because uh, all these checkings against. Uh, so, yeah, so we have at most this number of uh, clauses in the list, but uh, considering each clause also requires linear time, right? Because when you are in a close to the bottom of the list, then uh, you should try to resolve it against each of the previous, and this is roughly speaking n. And also, you should, if you get something, you should check it against everything before that. So it could be even the fourth power, but you can make it cubic if you program it accurately. So this is the home assignment, well, which will be formally presented in the on the course's web page and in the chats. But this is the idea what you should do. So. Uh, you will be given the two CNF as your input <coughs> input data, and uh, there will be an easy and full version of the task. So uh, there will be published uh, criteria for the course, uh, and in the criteria for final marks, there are two uh, parts. So there is the final exam, which will be just the final exam, and there will be the accumulated grade for the home tasks. And in the accumulated grade for home tasks, this will be one of them. It will have weight four out of ten. So the second one will be also four, and the final one will be two. So these four points, they uh, the easy version has two points, and the full version two extra points. Of course, you, as you can see here, when you should solve the full task, you automatically solve the easy task, if, if it is correct, of course. So the easy task just asks you to check satisfiability using resolution method. And the full one asks to return the, one of the satisfying assignment. Of course, not all of them. Returning all the satisfying assignment could be not polynomial. And this is unconditional thing. Why? Because just uh, you could take a formula, for example, it is always true. There are two to the power of n satisfying assignments, right? So there is no way to uh, quickly print them all out just because this, their number is exponential. But this asks just for one. So you take arbitrary choice. You can run a randomizer or say always take one, always take zero, and you should return one of the satisfying assignments. And now, what are the tricks here? And why did I say parsing in the beginning of this lecture? The input should be given in a human readable form. So uh, I will say it here. Uh, I don't know. So OK, I think I've failed to put an example here. Uh, but let us see the thing here. So it should be really a formula, which, include, which is built using negation, conjunction, disjunction from clauses using conjunction. So it should be not something like an array of arrays or something like that in the internal machine readable form, but it should be just a string of symbols as a human could Im include it. So, uh, also, there is implication. This is just for fun. Uh, in addition to disjunctions, oh, sorry, the a bare literal could be also a clause. I will add this in the official formulation. So you can have a clause of one literal without brackets, and you can have L1 or L2. This is a classical CNF clause. You can have L1 implication L2. Well, this is not officially a CNF clause, but it's reducible to it because it's not L1 or L2. It's just for the examples to be more digestible. So here we, it's, it's OK. Also, bare literal can be a clause. And then we just take a conjunction. It could be a string of symbols like this. And the program, which is uh, by default to be written in Python, should implement the following two functions. Is satisfiable, which takes this string, which represents the CNF, and returns just true or false. 
and set assignment, which takes a CNF and returns a satisfying assignment as an associative array. So for each value, uh, it says uh, true or false. So this is why I'm saying this, uh, this is important because I will try to implement an automatic grader and therefore the name should be like that because otherwise you just fail to. I will uh, put all the details in a official formulation of the assignment. So by default, we'll use Python 3. Uh, you may use uh, Python 2, but please inform me about that because otherwise the grader could just fail because we'll try to run it on Python 3. If you wish to use another programming language, well, this is acceptable because this course uh, does not include any introduction to Python. Uh, while you attended a master program at computer science department, you are supposed to be capable of programming in some language. It could be something else than Python, but uh, in this case, well, I will have to grade this manually because the automatic grade will, of course, fail. So please inform me about that also. And uh, the, in this case, I will be not that uh, able to help you in pro problems you could have with your programming language and also with the things you may use before parsing. So um, this is the definition of the CNF. Again, sorry that there is another case for clause which is not listed here, which is just L, a literal. A literal is a clause and you can, you don't want to put it in bracket. So the first thing you do is you should uh, translate the input into a machine digestible form, of course. And this is called parsing of the input. Again, you are not forced to do uh, parsing as I will explain now. You can do it manually. For CNF, it's absolutely possible, but I actually motivate you to use more standard techniques for parsing. This will uh, make it easier for you, and it's also important for you to understand the basic ideas of uh, formal language theory and parsing just for the future, because in um, data analysis, it's quite... Uh, common task that you should parse some inputs sometimes in natural language which is much harder because for natural language you do not have any formal grammars in a sense and uh, deterministic descriptions of how it works and if even if there were some that people could ignore them and write uh, sentences with mistakes and stuff like that some internet speeches things like that this is a specific issue but here uh, it's also important because you also have to parse formal languages sometimes input could be presented in a formal way. So there is a grammar. Again, you should add one extra thing for clauses, but you can ignore that and say that P or P is just a representation of P. But I will fix this in there. Even I think on the slide, I will put a better version. Uh, so uh, a CNF is either one clause or a conjunction of a CNF and one extra clause. Uh, a clause is like that. And literals variable or not variable. Variables will be defined as lexical items. We'll see it in, 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 the, in the next slide. So this quite intuitive explanation of uh, what a CNF means, a recursive definition. Uh, so yeah, the only thing which people usually get uh, sort of confused with that you say lit or lit. This does not mean that it is the same literal. So it's just a meta variable for being a literal. And using of this grammar is like sort of uh, substitutions. There's a meta symbol for CNF. You substitute that it is another CNF and clause. It's another CNF and clause and clause. You do this gradually, and then you replace each clause with one of these two possibilities. And each of them you replace a var or not var. And finally, each var gets replaced by one of the possible values for variable. So P, Q, X, Y, etc. And this gives you the concrete example of a word which is a CNF according to this grammar. But of course, such words, there are many of them, actually, infinitely many. So this is a backus now form, or it's called context-free grammar for our language. I will not go into details about what is the theory about that, but this is one of the good examples. And we shall use specialized software, which is called Python, Lex, and Yak, to automate the parsing process. So actually, what we're going to do, will put this description of the grammar into a specific module and it will generate the parser for us. We do not need to program it manually. Yes. So uh, this is the general parsing workflow. So first it takes the input, which is just a stream of symbols. 
Then it does the lexical analysis and replaces it with streams of tokens. We'll see it in a moment. It's much more convenient to work with tokens than with symbols. For example, one, just a number, a constant number, or just identify with one token, but it's several symbols. Then it goes upwards and goes to the syntactical analyzer, which is the parser. And according to the grammar, the parser returns as the recursive structure. So here will be a parsing tree of the, of the CNF, which will take, okay, what is a CNF? It should be an array of clauses. Each clause is an array of literals, and each, each literal is negation or just like that. So what is the lexical analysis? Okay, this is a trivial program in C. Uh, and let's pretend that we're writing a compiler for that, and we do lexical analysis. What are the tokens? So first, keyword integer. Identifier, which says that it is main. Open bracket, this is a specific literal. Keyword void, etc. And tokens are much more convenient than just letters in, to work with in the grammar. Even in our small grammar, for example, suppose that we want a variable to be denoted not just one of one letter, but say by uh, uh, several letters, just as identifiers in programming languages. If we do it inside the grammar, then you should add, add an extra subgrammar for var, which says var is either one symbol or a var with an extra symbol added or something like that. But this is all performed at the lexical side. And also at the lexical side, you could, for example, uh, ignore uh, blank symbols, spaces. So inside the your CNF, you just for readability, you could add spaces. Lexical analysis will be programmed that they remove that because they are meaningless. Okay, so a running example, the code is already published on the course's web page, and you can see how it works, but of course it's not the code for your assignment, and therefore we, uh, I decided to put another one. And it was simplifying polynomials, something like that. So the program should input a polynomial, which can be like this with brackets, you can, you can have to open them up, and you should simplify it. So this is a grammar. It's more complicated than the one we used for CNF to get a more, say, a real example. So an expression, so the terms, monoidal terms, and also optional integers, optional powers. So believe that that uh, re realizes the notion of polynomial. So you can either put it in brackets. Why terms and expressions? Because this, this is for priority. What operations are more prioritized than others? So a term is something multiplicative, an expression is something additive, and so so. Okay, so this is the grammar, and this is an example of the input written in this form, just as a linear string. So the powers are used with a circumflex symbol. Everything else is standard. For multiplication, as usual in algebra, we do not put any symbol here, but in, in program you will put something like asterisk. Something like this. So what is the implementation? <laughs> Lexical analyzer that is implemented by a thing called Lex. It's a standard way of doing this. And for syntactical analyzer, there is what is called YAC, which is uh, translated as yet another compiler compiler. Why compiler compiler? Because there's a, comp a program which generates lex syntactical analyzers, and traditionally they were parts of compilers for software. In Python, we'll use PLY, Python, Lex, and Yak, which is a port of this software to Python. Originally, it was developed for C. So we first declare tokens. Okay, I will show elements of the code, which will be more important. But again, as I said, the full code is available on the course web page. You can download it and see how it works and try to compile it. It will compile out of the box. You just run Python on it, but nothing, nothing more. So. Um, for each token, you declare uh, what's called T function. So uh, if you have a token, which is, well, the tokens and literals. Literals, well, they're not that literals in our CNFs. They are just one uh, symbol tokens. And they just get passed as is. So if you have plus, this is plus. But if a token is complicated, you declare a name for that int. And here what happens? You define a T function, which says, OK, you should take the t value from somewhere and uh, put it into the same t value, but after some transformation. So the t value originally was the uh, token as a string of symbols, 
But as an integer, you want to translate it into, real, into, into an integral number. You do it by this typecasting int, a string to integer. This is also try except, which means that you, if, if the value is bad, then it's too large, you will just go with an error. But what happens if, uh, how does this system know that it's really an integer? That this int is really a, uh, a denotation for integers, so integer. And this is on the first line, actually. You see here is a regular expression which says that it's d plus, so it's a string of digits. It's a regular expression in Python. And this is an interesting thing here, because what is actually this? It's just a regular expression. So it does not, uh, it may compute it, but it does not put it somewhere, neither it uh, uses it in some way. So Python will actually ignore this. It's a sort of comment, just a bare, object you just start, start your function with saying okay i put here the regular expression i don't do anything with that but it's here but uh, when the lexical analyzer gets generated it reads up all these annotations from the code and it uses them in, the, in generating the lexical analyze and this uh <laughs> utilizes the fact that uh, python is a semi-interpretable language so when you run your code, you can actually look up inside the code and use it as, as an input date. So this is sort of a tricky thing, but in the implementation, it's very easy. So there's another example, regular expressions for names or identifiers. Here we don't have any t function. We just declare t name as the following regular expression. Why? Because we don't need to do anything with the t value. You just copy them. And finally, you import this plwild.lex as lex and build your lexical analysis. You write, run it using lex lex. Now for parsing, basically the same happens. So for parsing, you again do the following. So here, this the first function is just multi multiplying polynomials. It's, it's, it has nothing to do with the anal analysis, just multiplying polynomials which are presented as uh, strings of symbols, uh, strings of uh, coefficients, strings of natural numbers. And uh, this is the example of one of the rules of the grammar. So here it says a term is a term multiplied by an expression in parentheses, in brackets. And it says, OK, how do I compute its value? So the value is, so this, this is p. The value is kept in the, the p is an array. For each rule, you will have an array of uh, objects associated to the uh, elements of the array, uh, to, 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 to the uh, meta symbols. So you see that the zeros one is the one which is going to be associated with the main one, and others one on the right. So uh, passing procedure is recursive. You go from bottom, from the ground level, the string of tokens, up to the uh, topmost meta symbol, which is on top of the tree. And going upwards through the tree, you compute something. So at each in internal node, you will have, so on the leaves, you will have these t values, which we have already computed. And on each internal node, you will have um, some value, which is computed from the values of the things on the bottom uh, using these p functions. Is that clear? So it's just just recursive uh, interpretation of the tree from leaves to root. Well, in computer science, the root is usually on top, which is counterintuitive. So on on the leaves, you know the values, and then at each time, at each point upwards, you replace them with uh, uh, you use them in order to obtain the value for the internal node. And here the value is a <coughs> polynomial represented by a sequence of coefficients, and we indeed uh, com computed. So here the main point, you take this is a polynomial multiplied by a polynomial, and you keep it not just as a multiplication of two polynomials, but you really compute the coefficients of the product using this polymult function, which exactly does that. How do you compute the uh, value for this? 
So uh, on the top of that, you will get this big expression, which is the polynomial, and you will compute this array, which is P of zero. And this array will give us the result. So it will be a list of coefficients. And then you can again uh, reproduce in a human readable form, just as a real polynomial. So this is here. And you see that it's on the slide also. So it generates a new object P0 using the objects which were already obtained. So why here there are P1 and P3, but not P2? Well, because there are two brackets. And brackets, formally, they give P2 and P4, but they're meaningless because it's just a bracket. There's no internal information inside that. And you build the parser actually in the same way you build the Lexa. We import this module and build it. The course can, the full code can be found, found on this page. There you can find how it is uh, used. There is also another example, which is the calculator. And there you can play with priorities operations, which is not the case for polynomials. For polynomials is fixed, but there you can say that multiplication is better, is more, more priority than uh, addition and stuff like that. So good luck with this assignment. Uh, I hope that, so there are actually two parts. First, you have to cope with parsing, mm -hmm. as I uh, uh, explained it to just now. And afterwards, you what, what will you obtain? You'll obtain a CNF in a good digestible form. The best way to do it is something like you have literals, which are just pairs of, uh, so a pair of uh, name of the value and uh, true or false. Negation or not, not negated or negated. Then each clause should be an array of uh, of uh, literals, but actually there could be only one, one or two, or zero if it is empty. But zero does not arrive, uh, appear in the original CNF, it could appear in the future. So next, the CNF itself is a list of clauses. So list of list of literals. And uh, then you apply the algorithm, which we, so this is the second imp important part of the assignment. You apply the algorithm, which we uh, discussed at the beginning of today's class, really apply resolution. So actually, you could implement it not only for two CNF, you could implement for arbitrary CNFs. It's all up to you. Uh, it should work correctly for two CNFs. For arbitrary ones, well, you could implement it, and it will, it will just work fast for two CNFs and possibly slow for arbitrary ones. It's up to you. The official is for two CNFs because just implementing uh, slow algorithms is not that good from a methodological point of view. And it's also hard for testing. How could I test it if it is exponential in time? Mm -hmm. oh, so um, now I think we have some time in order to uh, uh, in order to um, talk about uh, the proof of this complete theorem for resolution, because it's the basis of our uh, considerations for uh, this stuff. So uh, this is the completeness theorem that if we cannot obtain the empty clause by applying resolutions, then the CNF is satisfied. So this is the interesting part. The opposite is trivial. And we prove it using induction of the number of variables. So induction means that we start with zero variables, which will be trivial, and then we step from n to n plus one variables. So we suppose that we know the theory for n variables and prove it for n plus one. So, um, okay, zero variables. What, is, what are the possible clauses? The only possible clause is the empty one. We have no variables. How can you build a clause? Only the empty one. But our CNF does not include it because we have the condition that it, it could not be generated in this iteration. Therefore, the CNF should be empty. And how can you satisfy the empty CNF? Well, by an empty assignment. No variables, no problems. Okay, so from n to n plus one. So let's call this new variable Q, and let's saturate it, and saturate the CNF and get saturated version, which we denote of one by S. Now take all clauses which do not include Q, and not Q, and remove Q out of them. So these are positive clauses for Q. You take the clauses which do not say that Q should be false. Possibly Q could be true there, but you remove it outside and try to saturate everything else. It's called S plus and usually for S minus. Okay. So what about S plus and S minus? S plus and S minus do not include Q. 
So they include less variables, they include n variables, p1, pn. And therefore our theorem is applicable to them. And they both are saturated. Why? Because if you had a new resolution which could be applied inside one of these guys, then the same resolution could be applied inside S and given you close. But S is saturated, so these guys are also saturated. And let us show that at least one of them is satisfiable. Okay, suppose they both include bottom. So again, we use the theorem. If our CNF is not satisfiable, then by resolution, right here, you could uh, include, uh, you could deduce bottom. And it's saturated, so you have deduced bottom by resolution. If S includes both Q and not Q, okay, if they both include bottom, what does it mean? In the original CNF, there was no bottom, right? Because it was, uh, it didn't give us bottom in resolution. Therefore, this bottom was obtained, it's empty clause, when we removed Q or not Q, right? Because how do you obtain S plus and S minus? We removed Q and we removed not Q. In order to, to do this, we, uh, so it, it became empty after we removed it. And therefore, there should both Q and not Q inside S. And by saturation, it should be bottom in this contradiction. And we know the theorem for them because they have less variables. And the one which does not include bot, it is satisfiable by theorem. So if S plus is satisfiable, then taking the satisfying assignment and take Q equals zero. Why should this work? So in S plus, we have all clauses without not Q. And they are even stricter because we removed Q from them. And these clauses are already satisfied by the assignment which satisfied S plus. We do not need Q to satisfy them, right? And all other clauses which we which are away from S plus, they included not Q. And then we satisfy it by saying that Q should be zero. So again, S plus is the positive part. It it, it, these are the clauses which did not include Q negative. It could include Q positively. They are already satisfied. We don't have to care for them. And therefore, we have to care for the negative part, which includes not Q. And which include not Q, then you put Q which equals zero. And of course, dually, clauses with not Q are satisfied by, oh, by Q equal, no, okay, by not Q equals one, yes. So Q equals zero, not Q equals one. And dually, if S minus is satisfiable, again, S minus takes care of the stuff which includes not Q, or at least does not include Q. So if you don't include Q, you're already fine. You have satisfied it using the satisfying assignment for S minus, which we obtained from our induction hypothesis. And uh, for the, the guys that included Q, they're outside S minus, but we just satisfy them by taking Q equals one and do not care for anything. So this is the inductive way of proving uh, uh, completeness for resolution. So, so far so good. Uh, we have discussed, we will return to them, to these problems uh, along the course, but by now we had a solid thing. We discussed Boolean functions, uh, discussed satisfiability for them, of Boolean formula, satisfiability for them, resolution method, which is sound and complete method of proving, of established satisfiability. What we managed to understand that if you have a formula in a DNF or a 2CNF, then checking satisfiability is easy for DNF is trivial for two CNF is by resolution. Um, but if you have a three CNF, it's still unknown for us whether you can obtain a fast algorithm. It is unknown to all the world, but there are conditional results with this PNP theory, and this will be the topic for the next two lectures for NP completeness and stuff like that. But what, what about going beyond? Of course, Boolean logic is too weak. So I said something boldly that using Boolean formula, you can define some constraints on objects and stuff like that. But of course, if you try to really do this and you want to define some properties, for example, I don't know that, that there exists a number of a quadruple of numbers which are based Fermat's theorem. Again, you will need some arithmetic. You will need some more sophisticated logic. And so propositional or Boolean logic is uh, too weak for many situations. So about uh, the term propositional, it comes from the, again, the term proposition, which means that it is, we consider atomic propositions, atomic facts as black boxes. So inside, you don't have any structure. You say that, okay, 
You have P is just P. In our examples, we had, okay, investments are raising. This is P. But uh, it doesn't say anything about investments or raising. It's just a black box, you see. So to allow rich expressive capabilities, you should use more powerful logical languages. They were introduced well in the end of uh, 19th century. Uh, one of these is the first order predicate logic, which is usually used to formalize mathematics. So this will be the topic of our practical class today, just after this lecture. So I will give a short introduction. We'll not stop much on that and we'll see today why. So, but in mathematics, this is the usual thing to do. So we have, now we have another sort of variables. We have individual variables. So Boolean variables, they ranged over zeros and ones, right? They were elementary propositions. But now the variables that range over a domain, over some objects. So for example, numbers, graphs, uh, I don't know, sets in set theory and stuff like that. So these are not, uh, they do not denote truth, they denote objects in, in some way. And for truth, you will have predicate symbols, which include these guys inside and they form propositions. So the standard thing is uh, two argument uh, objects would say uh, two argument predicates, they denote binary relations. So, for example, we write x is less than y. In these formal languages, it will be less applied to x and y, but we use it in any fixed form. So, there are relations between objects. The relations are binary, but also you could think about ternary relations, for example. The classic example in math is just two. Uh, Numbers are comparable module another number. X equals Y mod P. I think you've heard it in number theory or somewhere else. So this is an example of ternary relation. There could be also uh, unary predicates. For unary predicates, examples are something like the a number is prime or a number is even, etc. So it's uh, uh, unary predicate. We don't usually call it relation because it does not relate. Also, there is a sort of trivialized situation where then zero arguments. And these are just uh, predicate symbols, but they do not include any arguments. This means they're just Boolean propositional variables or constants. So they just denote zeros or ones. And these are interpreted, so if X, Y, Z, they run over a domain, over an, the domain of objects, then uh, predicates, they are just, they denote functions from this domain or and argument functions of the domain which return zero or one. So say this less can be also represented as such a function. It takes two numbers and it returns zero if x is less than y and one if not. Oh no, zero if not and y if, if x is less than y. And now beside propositional operations there are quantifiers for all and exists. And this is an example. So this is sort of what is called closed formula. It does not include three parameters. So uh, this says for all x, for all y, something happens. So for all possible values of x and y, the formula in brackets should be true. And what does it say? That if r of x, y, so they're in this relation, then there exists a z which is in these relations with x and y. This can look a bit scary, but if we replace r with less, this is quite a natural thing, that if x is less than y, strictly less, then there exists some z, which is strictly between them. And this is the standard property, which is called density of the order. The order is dense if between any two elements you will can find another one, another one, another one. So this formula is true on, say, the interpretation of rational numbers on Q, right? Or on real numbers. But not true on Z. Because if we take one and two, for example, there's nothing in between. Because the inequalities are strict here. And so it's satisfiable, but not universally true. So the word universally true here is the substitute for the word tautology in Boolean logic. So here we do not say tautology, we say universally true. It's just a matter of terminology, nothing deeper. Also, this is all for formulae which do not include parameters. So all the variables should be captured by quantifiers. If you have open parameters, they will also add to satisfiability that uh, it's satisfiable if for some values of the parameters you will get satisfiability, and it's universally true if for all values of the parameters it should be true. 
this implicitly means that you can just add the corresponding quantifier for satisfiability existential one for universal truth the for all. And again, these notions are dual. So a formula is universally true if and only if its negation is not satisfiable, right? So what does it mean? Universally true that means the formula is true in all possible uh, situations, all possible interpretations, and there are no chance for the uh, negation to be satisfied somewhere. And if the negation is satisfied, then at, in this interpretation, the formula is false, so it's not universally true. It's absolutely the same as in Boolean logic. So just richer language, more interpretations. But the real uh, thing, which is much more interesting, much harder here, is that now interpretations are very complicated. There could be infinite. And in, the, in today's class, we'll see examples where infinity is important. Actually, this one is an example because this is density. How can an order be dense if it is finite? Well, no way, right? It's always discrete. So okay, if you have several objects, but OK, you should add something that X is not less than X. Otherwise, it's trivially satisfied, but it's not interesting. Let's say if it is a linear order on a finite set, it's just n points discrete. And between two neighbor, neighboring points, there could be no intermediate one. So uh, this means that the, it, they could be intendedly infinite. But if you have infinite uh, things, you jeopardize all our algorithmic theory about uh, satisfiability and universal truth. So when we talked about Boolean formulae, our actual aim was to make our algorithms more, uh, say, practically tractable, make them faster. But there was no doubt that there exists some algorithm because you can just brute force, you can just try all possible zero one interpretations and get the result. Here, such things are impossible. Because if you want to, def to find out whether a formula is universally true or whether it is satisfiable, for example, you have to <laughs> brute force over all infinite interpretations, there are infinitely many of them, and they are themselves are infinite. So even checking whether a formula is true in a given interpretation, this could be also, we couldn't find out. And a gr great example, they, for, for example, Fermat-Last theorem, first order formula in language of arithmetic. You should have special predicate symbols for B. For, for example, by the way, plus. If you interpret the predicate symbol, it will be ternary. X plus Y equals Z, right? So it's a binary operation. It's graph is a ternary predicate. And in this, uh, in this language, you can uh, formulate some hard and even unknown to the current state of uh, art and science uh, number theoretic principles. So for Fermat theorem, it's known that it's true but it's absolutely not trivial and not easy in any way. And algorithmically, this boils out into the following fact, that satisfiability and duly universal truth, of course, in uh, predicate logic, unlike Boolean logic, is algorithmically undecidable. So this means that there's no algorithm which, given a formula, decides whether it is uh, satisfiable, whether it's universally true, or even for some specific models like uh, natural numbers, that it is true in the given model. So it's all algorithmically undecidable, unfortunately. Uh, is it good or bad? Well, this is a discussion, because uh, the bad thing is that you could not run algorithms on them and uh, do such things, which uh, is unfortunate. The uh, good thing is that this makes uh, mathematics a creative uh, job. So when you are a mathematician, you actually do proving that some things are universally true or true under some conditions. This is established by highly non-trivial non things like you have to uh, in invent proof. This involves some degree of uh, creativity. And this theorem says that uh, this is inevitable. You cannot do it automatically by a computer. Uh, so uh, this going further into that is not the topic of this course. Uh, so what, what first, how to prove this theory? And actually, you could ask more how to in the in general, how to prove that something is undecidable. So it's easy to prove that something is decidable, right? You just take uh, the algorithm and prove that it's correct. Uh, 
for all this PNP stuff, how to prove that something is hard? Well, you can, as the current state of art, you cannot prove this usually, but you can conditionally prove it. And we'll discuss this in details because it's important for data science. But usually in algorithm, in the algorithmic problems which are used in real, say, uh, applications, they're usually decidable. And the strike is for effectivity. Here we face a situation where something is theoretically undecidable. No algorithm. So it's, uh, even without any time or resource constraints, you just don't have an algorithm. And this is the theorem, it's unconditional, so it's formally proved. How to prove this? Well, this is a specific topic in courses in logic and theory of algorithms. Usually people discuss that. Here is just taken for granted, just to say some see some limits of expressivity. So it's a trade-off between expressivity of the language and decidability. If you want to express more, you face undecidability of the corresponding algorithmic problem. So for Boolean formula, you are decidable, but they are poor. These guys are rich, but they are undecidable. And another thing is what to do with mathematics and how the computer can help in that. So uh, we do not have an algorithm for solving uh, satisfiability or uh, general truth, but we have some software which interactively with the human uh, finds out whether something is a theorem. So this is called interactive theorem proving. Uh, it does not do all the things automatically due to this theorem, but it can do stuff uh, in a better way uh, with uh, some hints from the human. So it, you, you start proving something is done semi-automatically, something is done by um, hints of the user. So this is again a topic of very, very another course, it's specific things. Uh, it's interesting, but no, no, not for this course. And this motivates studying decidable fragments of predicate logic, where we restrict its expressivity in order to gain decidability. Usually, but not always, these fragments are in between Boolean logic and so propositional logic and predicate one. Uh, this means that uh, you usually include Boolean logic because it's quite harmless and it's quite easy to solve, but it's still going to be hard, so maybe people could try to even do some fragments of Boolean logic. And it includes predicates to some extent. And there is a toy example, which we could easily understand now that you have predicate logic with only unary predicates. You don't have any relations. Why is this decidable? Let's just a bit speculate about that. So if you have only unary predicates, you do not care about uh, relations between individuals. So this means that uh, all individuals are in a sense independent. So in this situation, uh, while well, all the predicates are unary, this means that uh, for each object, you have only finite choice of possible values of these predicates. Each predicate is zero or one. And therefore, actually, each object gives us a small model for Boolean logic, right? So for each, just if we stand in, each, in, in some object, we do not look at other ones because there are no relations. And uh, uh, even no equality relation, x equals y. And uh, looking at that object, you uh, say that um, predicates are true or they are false. And then you are uh, just uh, doing that, you um, find out that uh, Non there are only there are a finite number of non-equivalent objects, two to the power of n, where n is the number of predicates, right? If two objects get the same truth values for all predicates, so all tr well, true on the one object are true on the other one, and all false on the first one are false on the other one, they could be yeah, identified. There's no way to uh, find out that they are different in our language. And this means that our model is in effect finite. So we don't need to consider infinite models and a finite number of them because the number of them is also bounded by an exponential and therefore uh, this is an algorithm just brute force which finds out whether the formula is satisfiable just finds out whether there exists a model so this is a toy example usually uninteresting well it's uninteresting due to its very close connection to boolean logic so it's actually it is boolean logic so if you're only unary predicates well, you have quantifiers, but these are, say, quantifiers over 
Boolean objects or Boolean uh, estimations. So they will get another level of exponential in your algorithm, but still be indecidable. More interesting examples are called description logics, which are used in modern informal ontologies. So this is a very big business. And uh, here at HEC University, there is also a team working with uh, Michael Zaharyashi from, uh, from London, from Birkbeck College. They uh, do research on description logics. And uh, so some people are here at the computer science department, some people are in the philosophical department in the School of Humanities. Uh, so this is a very big deal. I will, now we have a bit of time left at the end of the lecture, I will give some very vague introduction there, but if you're interested in that, then please contact the corresponding people. Uh, so uh, there are abbreviations here. Uh, the first one is OWL. Uh, well, it should be WOL because it's web ontology language, but OWL is more well, science in a sense. It's a wise bird, so it's usually called OWL. Uh, and the other abbreviation here is SNOMED CT. It's a medical uh, knowledge base, which is uh, connected to OWL somehow. So what is this? It's formal ontology. So you try to um, organize uh, knowledge about something which you have on the web or in some database, and this is called knowledge representation. Uh, so what is the difference between uh, just databases and why, wh wh where did it come from? So actually description logics, they come from two somehow independent sources. So the first approach, how could you start working with description logics is that you take, as, as said before, you take uh, algorithmically undecidable first order logic. In first order logic, you can actually talk virtually about everything, but you are undecidable. You don't have effective mm -hmm. algorithms to check whether your um, uh, question gives true or false answer. Uh, on the other side, you have Boolean logic, which is decidable, but it's very poor, and you consider some intermediate fragments. So you allow quantifiers, but only to some extent. Uh, and another approach, which is sort of dual, which came from just uh, not it, we don't call it computer science i think it'd be people didn't use the term computer science before it was just computing using your computers databases so maybe you know this uh, notion of a relational database where each uh, table of the database is interpreted as a relation maybe binary or an array so you say that for example there is a database of uh, for example uh, students and their I don't know, scientific advisors, the people, the professors with whom they do their research. And uh, the student is an object in our database. It's one of the objects of the database of the university people, in a sense. With the, And there is, so it is of type person, and uh, there is a unit of predicate which says that this is a student. At some point, by the way, it, this student could be also an employee. For example, it the, the, the same guy could be a PhD student or a master student like you, also say a teaching assistant. With two roles at, at the same university, it's okay. There'll be a big database of the, of the university, which includes it. Another guy, not a student, it's a professor. And uh, there is a binary relation uh, between um, students and professors that say that this is the advice of that student, the professor's advice of the student, which means that um, uh, they're in a specific relation. So you could formulate uh, some uh, queries or some properties of this database. So the usual thing there is there are languages of queries which are not that rich as the, what they called knowledge representation languages. So uh, this includes sim simple things. You have one student, say John, and you want to ask who is his advisor. Well, the standard, say in SQL, this is a query. You it looks up in the database and finds out this is the advice of this guy. Uh, also, for a professor, you could find a list of the students of this professor advisor. For a student, possibly there could be several advisors, and they will give also several lines and stuff like that. What about what, why knowledge? So, what is the difference between just access to database, which is well known and by the way well optimized, because for databases. Here, let's compare. So we uh, talked about satisfiability for Boolean formula. For 2CNF, we arrived at, say, cubic time algorithm. Is that nice for databases? Well, no. 
if we are sus if we are not linear, well, the database could be enormous and you, you fail. So uh, they were well optimized how to solve the, the, the simple queries for databases. This is the standard one. But the QA language evolved and included more and more, say, um, interesting features. And one of these features was, say, logic. You can say, OK, please find me the students which have, OK, uh, which are advised by this professor or another professor. Oh, please find the students which are not teaching advisors, but which are advised by that professor and also many, many possibilities. So propositional logic was in the very early times introduced into query languages of our databases. Here um, we enhance this language by some sort of quantification. So we could ask more global questions uh, and they could be even true or false. For example, the students at the beginning of their study course they should choose an advisor this is not a not so easy process i think you are also doing that at some point uh, and they should inform the study office that they did it or they the choice of courses they should have to choose a, a course is another entity it's of another type by the way yes in, in first order logic right now we had only one one type of objects in the domain it's done just for simplicity but you can also have sort of multi-sort first order logics where objects can have different sorts. Or that can, this can be implemented by, by unary predicates. You can say that all the objects are of type object, but uh, then there are unary predicates. So that this object is a person or this object is a, a, a class or this object is, I don't know, something else. And then these uh, could be also in, in, interpreted somehow. So in the knowledge database, you can ask global question, for example, the students should have chosen an advisor, but uh, did this really happen? And the study office wants to know that, the big database. It asks a query, just, uh, are there, does there exist a student which, who didn't choose an advisor? Again, this, this still can implemented in pure SQL, but it's all logical formula, which includes a quantifier. If you want a true false answer, but not just a list of them. But also uh, something else could be harder that does there exist, uh, uh, for example, a student who is, uh, say, uh, whose advisor is somehow that for, for him it exists, blah, blah, blah. So all this can be exp expressed in these knowledge representations. And also these are queries, but also there could be axioms which keep the system consistent. So, for example, if we have this sort object, inside it we have the sort human in person, inside this person we have the sort student, we have to say that if one is a student, then he is a person, if a person is an object, that a student, if he if is a person, this is not this is joint with the term, say, course and stuff like that. It's all included as also some data, but it's in a sense a meta level data. So it's a different thing. And uh, OK, usage of this in such situations like universities is funny and it's also used, but not the most interesting thing. More interesting stuff comes in OWL where we decide, um, where we talk about um, web and about ontologies in this original sense. Well, this was very popular on the rise of the World Wide Web. By now, it's somehow not that interesting, uh, but uh, still people consider that. So well, what is what is uh, web ontology? We try to categorize the objects on the web and try to find out some relations between them. Of course, in these uh, things, uh, this uh, comes into a very tight connection to artificial intelligence methods, uh, machine learning, because these ontologies, if the ontology of, uh, say, objects in the university can be just formally de described, just you know what are professors, what are students, what are courses, of course, in the wide and this wild world web, uh, things are quite crazy and these ontologies should be obtained somehow from data. But people do this. This is a real industrial thing. Now the second thing is SNOMED, and this is also a very big field of applications, which is connected to medicine. So here, all these uh, formal medical pro protocols, they get formalized and their notions of disease, of, uh, correct cure of the disease, of symptoms, all the in the big knowledge database. And this is, uh, yeah, the, it says that it's five minutes left from our scheduled meeting time. It's, it's great. Yeah, we'll now uh, start the descent and uh, finish the lecture. Okay. So this is a big thing which I just wanted a bit to advertise. 
uh, as a possibly interesting field of uh, study. Uh, the problems there are basically the same as we see in Boolean logic, but of course, due to the, the fact that the language is more evolved, uh, algorithms are uh, more interesting and things become more complicated. But nevertheless, it's interesting field of research which is connected both to data science on one side and to logic and discrete math on another side. So this is one, maybe one of the first, say, real-world examples of uh, how these things are connected to each other. 